Perfect. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here at the Faith Pavilion, the first ever Faith Pavilion, for a fireside chat with Nuri Turkle, Comm Commissioner on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. And this will be on the topic, the interwoven threads, climate crisis, religious freedom, and the fabric of peace. Before diving into our discussion, I would like to introduce Mr. Nuri Turkle. In May 2020, United States House Speaker Nancy Pelosi appointed Mr. Turkle as a commissioner on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, where he served as chairman and is now serving in the role of commissioner. He is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, which, where he specializes in national security, foreign policy, emerging technologies, and forced labor and supply chain risk. He is also a senior legal fellow at Notre Dame Law School and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He was in Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World list and was a recipient of the inaugural Notre Dame Prize for Religious Liberty. So Nuri, my first question for you is, how is the climate change affecting the physical spaces and sacred sites of religious communities all over the world? Well, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, let me begin by thanking uh, Judge Mohammed Abdus Salam and his incredible team um, for the brilliant idea of putting together this uh, pavilion that I believe is the first time in COP's history. Um, I'm profoundly grateful um, that I have an opportunity to meet with um, uh, Judge Abdus Salam early this year and you and, and Mohammed. And I, I am very pleased that uh, you managed to brought me here to be part of this important event and also learn from the uh, faith community. The work that you guys undertake is, is tremendous, uh, building bridge between various faith groups. Um, as for your question, uh, climate change is affecting um, all aspects of life, including religious communities around the world. Sacred sites, uh, physical spaces hold immense um, cultural and sp spiritual significance to billions of people, as we've been hearing the last few days from uh, previous speakers. These spaces are increasingly threatened by rising uh, sea levels, uh, extreme weather events, uh, green technology development that I will uh, uh, say a few words about, uh, and other climate-related uh, challenges. So specifically, uh, rising sea levels, uh, coastal uh, religious sites uh, like the Pacific Island and Ven Venice uh, are at the risk of inundation. Rising tides can damage structure and disrupt religious uh, practices. Uh, extreme weather, fr frequent extreme weather uh, patterns such as hur hurricane floods and droughts have become uh, more in frequent and intense, causing destruction. Uh, to religious buildings and places of worship in some instance. For example, uh, during the Hurricane Sandy uh, in the United States, uh, that natural disaster, a natural uh, uh, weather condition, uh, caused intensive, uh, extensive damages to the places of worship, specifically churches in the United States. Um, melting glaciers, uh, threatening religious sites uh, like the Hindu pilgrimage sites in India. Uh, yesterday's speaker was mentioning some of this as well. The loss of glaciers can also disrupt uh, water resources, uh, vital for religious uh, rituals, specifically uh, Tibetan Buddhist community in China. Changes to uh, precipitation also bringing, uh, causing some challenges, uh, droughts and floods affecting water availability for rit uh, religious rituals like baptism. Uh, change of temp a change in temperature um, is making it hard to maintain religious sites, especially built uh, with uh, heat-sensitive uh, materials. Biodiversity is another interesting uh, aspect of uh, the, uh, the impact that we've been discussing. Many uh, sacred sites are located in areas of uh, rich uh, biodiversity, which is being threatened by climate change. Loss of biodiversity not only affects the ecological significance, but also these sites uh, impacts the cultural and spiritual practices of various uh, uh, religious communities that revere these uh, natural environments. Land grabs, uh, this is something new uh, that you may have read in the news that some uh, uh, major corporations um, uh, 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 engaging in large scales of uh, acquisition of land, often through coercion, 
manipulation and purpose for developing uh, the urban areas. In that the large corporations, uh, this is something that I've been uh, closely following, uh, foreign investors, for example, in the developing countries, uh, sometimes people refer to it as global thals, acquiring rent for, uh, uh, <clears throat> for business development, displacing uh, religious communities, ethno-religious communities, disrupting uh, traditional use of lands. For example, you may have seen this in the news that the American uh, company, Hilton, reportedly building a hotel on the site of cemetery in the Uyghur homeland in China. And resources extraction, and this is very fitting to the, uh, the uh, climate summit here, mining companies and other resources, uh, resource-hungry industries, acquiring land for uh, resource extraction, uh, specifically uh, in the areas of uh, uh, green technology development that has been denigrating the environment and causing displacement of uh, indigenous people. Glaring example of this is the forced labor practices that you may become aware of uh, in a green technology specifically, such as solar panels and EV batteries, uh, that have been uh, showing some uh, significant impacts on ethno-religious communities. Not only their way of life have been altered, but they also have been uh, subject to modern day slavery. These concerns are particularly salient uh, in the context of uh, uh, renewable energy sector uh, that relies on the extraction of uh, rare earth now we are moving to uh, moving away from fossil fuel and, and moving towards EV. Um, I closely follow this as part of my policy work where the uh, earth minerals, rare earth minerals and raw materials becoming increasingly in high demand. That I believe is also causing some um, concerns for the religious communities. As, as for the cultural and, and, and the spiritual aspect, uh, we've been um, uh, confronted with forced relocation, uh, challenges to the religious teaching, uh, that some communities are re-evaluating their relationship with the nature. Actually, this is positively affecting uh, the way that they approach um, uh, climate crisis, uh, looking at the way that uh, the, the enhancing educational programs need to be put in place, interface dialogue, and also influencing policy-making process, specifically in countries like the United States. Now we've talked a little bit about the physical um, effects of the climate emergency. What about the spiritual and psychological effects of the climate emergency on, on faith communities and how, how are they coping with their particular traditions? The climate emergency uh, has a significant uh, spiritual and psychological uh, impacts on members of uh, various religious communities, particularly the ones that I uh, follow, monitor, uh, as part of my government role. Uh, for many individuals, uh, environmental decay and the challenges posed by the climate change evoke deep emotional and existential uh, concerns, or responses, if you will. Uh, starter, for starter, the destruction of and, or degradation of natural landscapes sacred sites because of climate change can lead to profound sense of loss uh, and grief among the members of religious communities. Uh, these spaces often hold deep spiritual um, significance as we've been hearing specifically from yesterday's speakers and also seen as, as, a, as, a, as a tangible connection to the divine. So uh, that is uh, on the spiritual aspect. And then the the climate crisis also prompts individuals to reflect on the moral and ethical uh, uh, dimensions of environmental stewardship. Many faith traditions emphasize uh, the responsibility to, to care the earth and its inhabitants. This is actually uh, surprisingly that through my learning of uh, Islam uh, early on, uh, some years ago, I grew up in a communist country that there's no religious teaching, but I picked up both Bible and, and uh, Quran to learn. So it was a surprising then, I mean, didn't talk about 25 years ago, uh, that I saw something in the uh, this religious teaching book that uh, we have a responsibility to care for the earth. So when this responsibility is perceived to lead, um, perceived to be unfulfilled, and it can lead to feeling of guilt, uh, distress and sense of spiritual disconnection. So, and then the next thing is, um, I think the is existential concern. The climate change uh, rises, uh, raises uh, an existential concern about the future of planet 
and well-being of the future generations. As a father of two young kids, this is something that I think about quite often. Many individuals within religious communities experience anxiety, uh, despair, and sense of powerlessness in the face of environmental degradation, uh, particularly when these concerns are weaved through the lenses of their faith, uh, faith's teaching and creation, uh, interconnectedness, and the san sanctity of life. So what are the coping mechanisms uh, to your second part of your question and the spiritual responses? Driving up their faith traditions, individuals uh, often uh, find a solace in engaging in acts of environmental stewardship and sustainable living. Um, as a corporate lawyer, I hear this term more often than not in my uh, compliance discussions in my uh, other job. So this may include practices that says, such as uh, conservation, uh, responsible resource management, uh, advocacy for environmental protection. So by aligning these actions with the religious values, they find a sense of purpose uh, and agency in addressing environmental concerns. So there's also something very interesting and, and important, which is a ritual and prayer. So many individuals in the religious community turn to rituals, uh, prayers, and sacred te text with their faith tradition as a source of comfort, hope, and resilience in the face of ecological challenges, which this is something that I do quite regularly. These practices provide a framework for processing uh, feelings of grief, expressing gratitude for the natural uh, world, and seeking a spiritual and renewal and strengths. So, and finally, uh, community support. Uh, this is very important uh, when we address these key, uh, significant issues. Religious communities offer, uh, often uh, offer a source of social, societal support, solidarity for individuals uh, grappling with the emotional impact of the climate crisis. Uh, through communal worship, uh, worship, dialogue, collective actions, uh, members find strength, encouragement, uh, and sense of shared purpose in addressing environmental uh, concerns. So communities um, it becomes a space for a mutual uh, care, reflection, and advocacy for environmental justice. So spiritual and, 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 and psychological impacts of climate emergency on members of religious communities are profoundly uh, important and encompassing, encompassing feelings of loss, uh, moral reflection, and existential concerns. And I think the Faith Pavilion is, is proof that communities, faith communities, are engaging in the response to, to the climate emergency because yeah. of that climate anxiety. Pre precisely, yes. I, I, watching the people coming in and out here, uh, that's the sense that I got. And it's mm -hmm. quite impressive that you uh, designed this program, keeping in mind the, uh, the importance of uh, supporting each other. Yes. Um, I would like to now ask about migration and displacement. How are religious communities responding to the needs of displaced populations, um, including refugees and climate migrants? What have you seen in your work? So climate crisis uh, is exasperating um, migration and displacement in several ways. And religious communities, um, are playing a significant role um, uh, in responding to the needs of displaced population that we have seen in a kind of a humanitarian aspect. Uh, somebody is somebody uh, who grew up in an environment or the society that dealt with the uh, nuclear, uh, the fell off the nuclear testing for many, many years. I have seen people, this is years ago, it makes me feel like an old man, but uh, people already being subject to internal displacement. So um, in a m more moving forward to a, a current um, uh, the, the environment that we live in, uh, climate crisis is displacing communities from their homes, especially in the uh, vulnerable uh, regions such as low-lying coastal areas, small island nations, uh, specifically in the Pacific, uh, in some parts of the agency uh, close to here. And, and the, uh, the second uh, problem is the uh, scarcity of resources. The climate-induced uh, changes in ecosystem, uh, water availability, and agricultural productivity are contributing to the resources uh, scarcity, which in turn can lead, lead, lead into a conflicts uh, on natural resources or over natural resources. Uh, the conflicts can be forced people to flee their homes. Uh, we have seen it in, the, in, in, in 
many examples in recent years uh, and, and seeking, uh, seeking for a safety uh, and livelihood opportunities. Um, and in increased frequency, as I alluded earlier, of uh, natural uh, disasters resulting in sudden and large scale of displacement. As communities are forced to evacuate their homes, relocated to uh, places that they're not familiar with, uh, due to, uh, because of the destruction of their homes and infrastructure. So the religious communities have been responding to these uh, through a number of, uh, in, in number of ways. One, uh, the first one being the humanitarian assistance. Religious communities are often at the forefront of uh, providing humanitarian aid to displacement. Um, in my recent visits to the LDS church um, uh, in, in Salt Lake City, I've seen them uh, collecting uh, personal goods and clothing to do just this, to provide humanitarian assistance to uh, a displaced population. Uh, they offer support, uh, in some instances build shelter, uh, food, medical care, psychological services. This is very important as somebody who's part of a traumatized community. The psychological service is extremely important. Um, uh, and also, um, the, uh, making uh, those community members to feel that people care, uh, they're not alone. And then the second thing is advocacy and awareness. Uh, this is very important. Uh, once you recognize the issue, identify the issue, uh, raising awareness is equally important. And many religious organizations actively engage in advocacy efforts uh, to raise awareness about the challenges faced by displaced population and to advocate, um, uh, those, uh, advocate for policies uh, to address uh, the need of refugees and climate migrants they work to influence public opinion and government decision making on refugee and uh, migration issues. Uh, this is one area that our policy makers are missing the point. Uh, we often focus about reducing the CO2 emission, but we always, almost always forget about the human aspect. Uh, this is part of the problems that through my reading and following of uh, leading uh, climate uh, policy makers, both at home and abroad. Um, and religious communities also addressing through this problem uh, through welcoming uh, the, uh, the uh, refugee communities and helping them to integrate. They provide support, language learning, uh, vocational training, a societal integration, uh, promoting sense of belonging. This is very important when you are relocated or displaced to another places. And the solidarity uh, uh, for refugees and climate migrants. Uh, and also the groups, religious groups, are increasingly uh, vocal, as we just heard in the previous panel, uh, advocating for environmental justice, uh, sustainable policies to address the root causes of displacement related to climate change, uh, seeking to mitigate uh, the impact of climate change on vulnerable population. And finally, the moral and ethical leadership. This is something that we've also been seeing. Religious leaders, the ones that you gather uh, here, uh, uh, in Dubai and previously in, in Abu Dhabi that religious leaders and faith communities often provide a moral and ethical leadership on the issues relating to migration and displacement. So they help to share public discourse, uh, challenge stereotype, and promote cultural, culture of empathy, compassion, solidarity towards displaced people that are vulnerable to begin with and become increasingly even more vulnerable uh, after they've been displaced. You mentioned a bit about religious com leaders um, having the moral and ethical responsibility to speak out on the, the climate crisis and yeah. its impacts. Which teachings, which religious teachings and perspectives have you seen in your work that are being emphasized to mobilize action to respond to these environmental challenges? In, in, in your tradition as well, is there something that you can yeah. share? Um, religious leaders uh, and institutions, um, you know, I've, I've interacted with uh, various faith groups through my government role, um, the, the Baha'is, um, the, the uh, Rohingya community, the, the, uh, the Catholic community, as you well know, Emily, uh, the LDS community, uh, Baptist community. So it, it, it helped me to learn uh, and something very significant that the... Um, in addition to lending support to those affected uh, adversely, uh, religious leaders and specifically in the, in the faith communities that I interacted, um, 
have increasingly uh, vocal in addressing the ethical and moral dimensions of the uh, climate crisis uh, uh, that lead to many conflicts, as we uh, uh, discussed earlier. Um, their efforts uh, on growing recognition of interconnectedness uh, between environmental stewardship, social justice, and spirituality. I just attended a, an event in Washington before coming here on the occasion of 75 years of Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and this was one specific uh, issue that we discussed, how human rights and religious freedom in particular, uh, and, and how it's connected to the environmental justice. Um, so, so we continuing to see uh, the increased interest uh, on these issues. And then the, the, the one other thing that I um, uh, uh, recognize more and more uh, as part of my government role, I cover Tibetan uh, Buddhist community. Uh, they are increasingly concerned um, that uh, the, the environment that part of their spiritual life has been uh, facing uh, a irreversible uh, degradation and destruction, specifically related to water resources. So, um, and also sense that they have been also increasingly aware and more focusing on how and what can be done to influence uh, the environmental activist community, religious community, uh, and the government and societal level to address, uh, a a address this key issue and also preserve as much as they can. So um, the interconnectedness is something that I've been, I, I become increasingly uh, aware of and, and, and appreciative of. Uh, religious teachings, I, this is one of the brilliant aspects of this pavilion, that uh, religious teachings uh, can help to underscore the interconnectedness and interdependency of all living uh, uh, being in, in the environment. Yesterday you heard uh, 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 that, uh, you know, we all go to the same ground eventually. Uh, regardless of your religious background. So that kind of, uh, you know, a connecting connection and, 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 and helping to realize the, uh, the dependency, interdependency uh, is, is significantly important. And also um, uh, religious leaders, I've seen that sense that uh, been, uh, been very vocal uh, along with, uh, with the support of their communities on environmental justice issues. The one area that I mentioned briefly earlier is the um, uh, tackling in my, uh, climate crisis, f uh, focusing on emission reduction and also moving to the renewable emer uh, energy or industry has created this uh, anxiety within the religious community that if they will be sacrificed, if their interest is not as a priority uh, when it comes to solar panels, for example. Um, we have, uh, in the United States, there's a strong law, uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. When ap after that law is being implemented, the solar panel industry had managed to get an exemption. So that law does not apply for this uh, industry for two years. And then the question becomes, so my life is not as valuable as the, the, the glasses that people put on the rooftop, and knowing that those glasses, uh, solar panels made with the slave labor, oftentimes using the labor, uh, forced labor from the, uh, by the uh, religious communities. So, um, so that's one area. And also, um, and finally, um, the religious communities and institutions uh, promoting something very important, uh, humility and the simplicity uh, in life, uh, challenging consumerism. You know, I, I live in the United States. Um, it's pretty uh, consumer-oriented society. Uh, overconsumption um, and unsustainable lifestyle, and this is something that uh, religious teaching, modesty, in uh, you know, a simplicity, uh, and the religious teachers are promoting virtue of moderation, responsible consumption, and pursuit of a harmonious relationship with the nature in general. So these are the kind of things that, that makes me believe that we're on the right track uh, in addition to the uh, education and empowerment uh, and also um, uh, in, the, in the context of um, uh, religious teaching, um, prophetic witness and advocacy 
So those are kind of things that I'm seeing and sensing through my work, uh, working with interface community. And what's the role that you see for religious leaders in advocating for climate justice? Obviously, we're here at the Faith Pavilion where there's been 65 sessions with over 325 speakers. A lot of them have been either religious leaders or faith representatives talking about climate justice, but what's the role that you think that they can play in this uh, climate justice work? It, it, um, the religious communities can play a significant role in advocating uh, for climate justice and sustainable uh, practices uh, within their own faith community, tradition, and also uh, through the uh, interfaith communities. Um, the, the religious community's um, influence cannot be understated and that it extends beyond individual belief system uh, that encompasses the social and environmental action, policy advocacy, this is what I do on a regular basis, uh, promotion of ethical and moral responses to the climate crisis. Um, uh, here's some examples. For example, religious leaders and institutions m provide moral leadership by articulating the ethical imperatives of the environmental stewardship, uh, climate justice, and sustainable living with the respective uh, faith traditions. They offer ethical guidance uh, that encourages individuals and communities to align uh, their actions with the principles of justice, compassion, responsibility to the earth, and the future generation. I can't emphasize enough of what we're doing having this discussion, uh, having this climate summit on the future generation. It sounds hyperbolic, sounds like a catchphrase, but um, it is a serious concern. The second, um, uh, the, the second thing that religious communities um, can influence is through engaging in advocacy to influence the policy makers, uh, public opinion. Uh, when you mentioned, uh, uh, when you talk about climate, uh, climate crisis specifically, people think of uh, a bunch of people protesting um, uh, or switching uh, one type of uh, uh, vehicle usage to another. But it, it's a, the shaping right up of public opinion is instrumental in uh, influencing the thinking of the policy makers. At the end of the day, in the democracies like the one I live, uh, what people think, what people say, and what people demand matters. Uh, that's how representative democracy works. And that can help to create a healthy environment that we can fight uh, ecocide and a genocide at the same time. There's no, uh, uh, there's no uh, priority between the two. I genuinely believe that uh, those uh, who are uh, advocating for climate crisis uh, oftentimes have a tendency of excluding human rights, specifically in a bilateral, multilateral uh, 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 discussions. If a country that has bad human rights record said, I don't want to talk about human rights, if you wanted to uh, cooperate in the climate crisis, we should say we need to talk both at the same time. So there's no or, it, there should be and. Uh, we are capable of fighting uh, ecocide and the genocide at the same time. Um, religious institutions um, can serve as a platform for education uh, and awareness, awareness raising on climate issues, climate science, and sustainable practice. Uh, they can engage in public outreach, uh, educational programs, interfaith dialogue, the one that you often organize, you know, undertake, to foster deeper understanding of the ecological challenges facing the planet and promote responsible environmental behavior. Uh, and then uh, many religious communities uh, have implemented sustainable practices within their own institutions, uh, such as energy uh, efficiency measures, uh, uh, waste reduction, environmental, uh, environmentally uh, conscious land management. Uh, they also initiate e ecological restoration projects, community gardens, sustainable development initiatives that serves as a model for environmental stewardship. Um, interface uh, collaboration, again, back to the uh, important point. Religious communities often collaborate across denomination, uh, denominational and phase boundaries to address environmental challenges collectively. Uh, interface initiatives and partnership amplify, uh, amplify the voices of diverse religious tradition in advocating for climate justice, 
promoting shared values, uh, and fostering a sense of global responsibilities. So finally, um, the support for vulnerable communities, um, uh, and also a spiritual and ethical framework for action. Religious tradition offers a spiritual and ethical framework that inspire and guide individuals and communities to take action on environmental issues. Uh, they provide sense of purpose, hope, as I alluded earlier, resilience in addressing uh, the challenges posed by uh, climate change, motivating people to live in harmony with Earth, uh, and to work towards a more just and sustainable future. So in conclusion, I, would, I, I will say this. Uh, religious communities uh, play uh, a multifaceted role in advocating for climate justice and sustainable practices, leveraging their moral authority, social influence, ethical teachings to promote environmental stewardship, and advocate for policies and action that address urgent challenge by, posed by a climate crisis. I, I think this is, these are the things that, that, that people need to be keep in mind um, when they address climate crisis. Yeah, I think that's an important point, how you mentioned uh, human rights should not be excluded from the, the climate change, climate crisis discussions, and you can address ecocide and genocide at the same time. So. Precisely. Just one quick point. Um, uh, you know, when we push for a human rights concern to be included, people mistakenly think that we don't care for climate. We do. We all, because we live in one earth, this is the only thing when we, we live, we breathe in the same air. So um, the prioritization uh, of human lives. Uh, spiritual life in the context of our conversation is equally important. I don't think that anyone should be feel so great to put solar panels on their rooftop or driving uh, EV uh, battery uh, charged cars uh, with the mindset that they're conserving the plant uh, energy, saving the planet while ignoring human lives. Thank you so much, Nareed. That ends my questions, but I think we have one or two, time for one or two questions, if anyone has one. Uh, hi, oh, it will be a tricky opening question. First of all, thank you for sharing your um, insights. It was really interesting to listen. Um, I will ask perhaps for an advice. I've recently moved to US. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out the country. Um, you've mentioned the importance of protecting religious sites. Um, and we know that currently in Gaza, Palestine, both mosques and churches are destroyed amidst the ethnic cleansing. Um, and I think recently, having seen how yesterday US voted the ceasefire resolution being the only one on the Security Council, it has made a lot of um, both youth organizations and faith leaders upset. We know that Jewish Voice for Peace have been protesting, uh, and in the past, activists have been arrested. So. It's a tough question, but when the government support war crimes abroad, what can religious leaders or youth activists do? You know, how to gain that power in the policy and decision making? And I think this is especially relevant in the US context. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I served in a commission uh, that is bipartisan uh, with nine commissioners appointed by the president and Congress. We come into this work from uh, very different background, diverse background. Uh, I am the only uh, commissioner who does not have a very specific role in the religious community. You know, I'm a lawyer by training, specialized in anti-corruption, bribery invest investigation, and compliance work. So the point that I'm trying to make is this. Um, when we see something wrong, um, uh, destruction of religious sites, places of worship, cemetery, I don't think that's a political issue. I think it's a moral issue that people should be comfortably go out and condemn. Uh, we, you know, those of us who are a student of history know uh, what happened in Kristallnacht. So whenever a government actor or uh, 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 others engage in a destructive uh, 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 activities um, affecting people's lives, heritage, and spirituality should con deserve condemnation. So that's why I stand. And you know, in my role, even though that 
um, I have a government uh, a role of responsibility. Uh, our agency is the only uh, government agency, perhaps arguably in the world, that could criticize our own government. So this is what makes my agency, you serve, so special, uh, so important that we like to t uh, call ourselves as truth teller. Uh, we have a, 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 a congressman who is currently serving alongside me in the commission, Frank Wolf, who is the original author of the International Religious Freedom Act, often says that we have to tell it like it is. So uh, I feel very comfortable, you know, that kind of uh, destruction, whether it happens in China or in Russia or Ukraine or Middle East, uh, it is wrong. Um, and we should, we should take a moral stand on the issues like that. Any other questions? I think we have... Time for one more. If not, okay. I think we can close now. Thank you so much, Nuri, thank, for joining us today for you. this fireside chat. Thank, thank you, you, Emily. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much.